and it's a contest of can you have mounts that the other guy does not all about having right well what is the point of having a lot of mounts i mean i kind of already said this right i think it's uh stand in for being accomplished and so this is a contest of accomplishment trying to find out who the most accomplished person is in a duel and when asmongold loses these mount contests which he occasionally does he feels pain and where does that pain come from well you could ask him but to me i think a logical thing to feel pain for in that kind of a situation is your lack of accomplishment compared to someone else is being laid bare for the world and that's tough what's up folks i'm deeg here today thinking about why loot is overrated this thought crashed in on me a few days ago when i was doing as i do watching youtube videos and specifically a preach video where he went in blind to play a game called path of exile an action rpg with plenty of loot in it and while he was talking about the game one of the things that he said that kind of jumped out at me kind of rang a bell was that he doesn't like loot doesn't care about it this made me think really hard because preach is a guy who's known for playing world of warcraft he plays all these rpgs he plays all these games that have tons and tons of loot in them so how can he engage with these games if he doesn't like loot well thinking about this called me back to of all things a philosophy lecture and yes this talk is going to be relating a philosophy lecture to mmorpgs so bear with me folks if this is the kind of thing you're into you're in the right place The talk itself is heavily influenced by, as I said, a lecture series. It's called Awakening from the Meaning Crisis. It's by a dude named John Vervecki, smart gentleman, who's a psychology and cognitive science professor. I'm going to include a link to the lecture itself and a transcript in the video description if you want to uh, check it out yourself. And my goal is to have this be a listenable experience. So by all means, minimize this, put this in the background. Let's chill out and have a good think. In order to jump into this, what we're going to do is talk about the story, the myth of Siddhartha Gautama. He was a prince, and when he was born, there was a great prophecy that he would become either a great king or a great religious leader. His father, being a king, wanted his son, of course, to become a king like himself. In order to accomplish this, what he did was he removed all strife, suffering, and distress from the palace that Siddhartha grew up in. and made sure everything that Siddhartha could need was provided for him. Love, affection, attention, beautiful women, the right amount of food, uh, clean clothes, everything the guy could possibly need without the need to strive or stress to get them. Don't forget, as I describe this to you, that myths are not meant to be literal. They're allegorical. So what does the palace represent? Like I said, this is a myth, not a story. So everything is kind of meant to be meant to symbolize a bigger idea. The palace in this myth represents Vegas. It's a place where you can have anything. Young Siddhartha had merely to ask to have something, merely to reach out, and the thing became his. Being in the palace in a broader sense, in a philosophical sense, is meant to represent something called an existential mode, a mode of being, where you're, the way that you engage with the world and you see the world is primarily governed with a concern for having things. Another kind of um, way to think about this is uh, the palace metaphor, if you're a gamer, is a video game that gives you everything, say via a cash shop. We are gonna relate this back to gaming, but we got a little further to go yet. So bear with me. So existential modes, let's talk about two of them, having and being. In order to talk about the having mode, I'm gonna to talk to you about cups. Having needs are met by categorizing and controlling things like cups. This is a cup. That's a cup. A cup, in some senses, is like any other cup. It functions like a cup. It can be replaced by another cup if I damage it. 
and it improves my ability to control water, which I need so I don't die. So it ain't a bad thing. On the other hand, being needs are met by becoming something. Love, in a sense, is engaging in the act of being needed. When you're in love, you're trying to become something to someone, and they and you are also trying to permit that person to become something to you. L being in love meets the needs of maturity, growth, and development. So let's say you're in love with an amazing person. You're in a relationship uh, which is kind of characterized by mutual development, mutual realization. A great term that John Verbecki uses here is love. He says love is a process of reciprocal realization, something that I totally agree with having lived with my wife for a decade. We each grow in different ways, and our growth responds to the other's growth in, in ways that are very difficult to predict. It's an iterative process where we love each other over time, grow over time. It's a becoming process. And we don't think of the person we love categorically. My wife is not a woman I love. She is the woman I love. She's not like any other woman I could love. Cannot be easily replaced if she's damaged. And she's not meant to control the environment or for me to control her. I'm not trying to manipulate her or categorize her. The purpose of being in love with her is to make meaning, not to solve problems. So what does living in the palace mean? Like I mentioned, the palace is a symbol for an existential mode of having. And to live in the palace is, is a symbol of trying to live life in the having mode especially when what you're trying to do is become something. If you're trying to become something, like if you're trying to find love, and you're focused on having things, like having sex to find love, you're practicing something called modal confusion, according to John Verbecki. I really like this term. I think it's super useful, especially for gamers. And like I promised, we're going to get there, so bear with me. Modal confusion is trying to satisfy a being need such as love, progression, fulfillment, development, maturity, growth, by having things. Need love? Have sex. Need maturity? Buy, buy a car. Need relaxation? Take drugs. When these things don't work, what do we do? Well, I've been there many times myself, and I can tell you one of the things I've, that I've always had in order to fulfill a being need was food. Look at me. I'm a big dude. When food doesn't work, do you know what I t have tended to do in the past? I eat more food. The problem begets the problem when you're in this modal confusion. And the world makes it really easy for us to stay in this mode, doesn't it? How easy is it for me to fall into a, a existential mode of having in order to solve my needs for being? Watch commercials, listen to ads, be a person in the world. Everyone's trying to get your attention in order to get you to buy things, in order to pursue things. Um, the Western cult of capitalist individualism really, really kind of promotes this. And it's not really a cult. I shouldn't use the word cult. It's more of a, a culture, I suppose. Anyway, this is gaming related. And to prove it to you, I'm going to invoke everyone's favorite ex World of Warcraft developer, Kevin Jordan, as he explains a phenomenon called truck stop donkey hole. Let's have a listen. And uh, hope you enjoy the little chat about truck stop donkey hole. So what is Truck Stop Donkey Hole? So I first defined this in my, in my channel a while back. Um, and I compared it to something that, you know, very few of us have any knowledge of, but um, sort of the art of seduction, romance. Um, and, you know, for, for those like of you is, that Kevin. have had this experience, um, when you first meet a woman that you're interested in, 
there's like a slow, steady progression towards intimacy. Um, and that buildup is really exciting. That buildup is really satisfying. Um, you know, the first time you make a, that person smile, the first time you, oh, yeah. um, you know, you end up uh, a light touch on the arm you get from her. Um, you make her laugh for the first time. You know, these things are sort of amazing stepping stones towards ultimately, you know, wh where you want to be. But they're all in an in Sounds kind of familiar, right? Sounds like the process I just described about love and reciprocal realization. You see, if I'm doing this right, what I'm doing is surfacing something that we already know, that you know that I know deep within ourselves. And we're just finding some words for it. Keep on, Kevin. An incredible and an important part of uh, the process. Um, and eventually you get to those in intimate moments and that's the culmination of all of those previous moments and it makes the entire experience really more gratifying and more engaging and more uh, more compelling than it otherwise would have been. So the alternative to that is you go down to the local truck stop and there's a little hole cut in you know the, the bathroom where you put your junk and something happens on the other side and you take care of business and you leave, right? And you don't know what's on the other side. It could be a dude, it could be a it could be a woman, it could be a donkey, right? So having sex over being in love. I love that he uses the exact same metaphor that I'm using. And now he's gonna use it to describe something that is a little bit different than what we've been talking about, but it is pretty closely related. So I'm gonna let it play out. Uh, that's what we call it truck stops <laughs> truck stop donkey hole, right? Ba -ba. So and unfortunately, this, without realizing it, this is what players are frequently asking for when it comes to game design. They're trying to take the first story, the first process, which is slow and engaging and meaningful and building up to something really super amazing and reduce it down to its component parts, which is putting my dick in a hole. And that's it. That's <laughs> I love Kevin. So colorful with his words. Uh, Kevin's going to go on to talk about how um, what he's doing is he's reacting to an interview between a couple of uh, Escape from Tarkov uh, really high level players. One dude's named Pestily. One dude uh, I don't actually remember the name of. It's not here in the video description. But um, Kevin's critique of this conversation is going to be that the pro players who are on the screen who are discussing the game design of the game and critiquing it are very good at controlling the environment. They're very good at categorizing and controlling their environment to produce results. But what they might not have is the ability to evoke those thrilling experiences for everyone, which is critical for a game designer to have. And there's a difference between, between producing outcomes, which pro players are focused on. Actually, Kevin used a really great word in this talk, saying that pro, the, the pro players are very good at narrowing down the outcomes. Whereas as a designer, you need to be thinking about opening up outcomes. It's a very different kind of approach to game design. And I think it's, this is actually a really worthwhile video if you're interested. But again, the having sex versus being in love metaphor is useful in describing something very similar. <clears throat> Let's talk about another gaming dimension of this idea. Gas shops. You've seen them. I've seen them. What do you see in cash shops? Well, let's talk about a few things that are known to be in cash shops and what they can tell us about these existential modes of having versus being. So there are boosts in cash shops. What do boosts do? They help you skip progression, they help you skip to the end of a progression experience. So in a sense, what that's doing is it's, ha it's having you arrive at a state of maturity. So perhaps we can frame a boost as a stand-in for maturity, max level, etc. So when you're boosting your character, what you're doing is trying to become mature, but you're doing so by having a boost. What else? Mounts. 
I'd think about this one for a little bit. Um, when you have a mount, when you receive a mount, what are you actually trying to become? Um, I think the best way I can think of describing this is, is you're trying to become accomplished, right? One of the things about World of Warcraft, which is like the game that people point to with all the mount stuff for the most part, is that the mounts come from all kinds of different experiences in the world. And if you have a lot of different kinds of mounts in World of Warcraft, what you have are a lot of experiences and accomplishments. So having mounts is a proxy for being accomplished. And depending on what mode you're interacting with the world in, if you're in the mode of being in the palace, where you're focused on having things and categorizing and controlling your environment, then in order to become mature, you have a boost. In order to become accomplished, you buy a mount. Another, I think, more conceptually experimental way of looking at cash shops in this kind of modality is thinking about gambling. Now, I'm on record as saying I don't think that there should be a wallet to gambling transaction possible in, um, in modern video games. I don't think they're a good thing to be there. I think, I think they're not, it's not a good thing for people to have unfettered access to. Uh, at least games that are marketed towards, towards young people. Um, but that being besides the point, what is gambling doing? If we're thinking about being in the palace, gambling is sort of like a proxy for taking risks, isn't it? And what does taking risks mean? Well, to me, taking risks is like, is trying stuff, is getting out in the world, is experimenting, is living life, trying different jobs, trying different experiences, meeting different people. Anything you do in the world has an uncertain outcome. You cannot guarantee what the outcome of a job interview is going to be. You can't guarantee what the outcome of a date is going to be. You just don't know. But the possibility that you could get the right thing, the possibility that you could win, is really, really enjoyable. And it's the thing that kind of encourages us to get out and explore and take on the world. Gambling subverts this and takes us out of the being mode of risk-taking by providing us with this wallet to random chance kind of transaction. I'm not going to dwell too much harder on that. I talked about this a lot in my Guild Wars 2 video last week, the one about what Guild Wars 2 needs to research if you're interested. Okay. So, now that we've talked about cash shops, we can talk about the title of the video, Loot. <clears throat> and let's think about the being needs that are being met when we have loot. How about gear? Whenever we get the next drop of gear that's going to improve our item level of our character, that's going to make us have a little bit more stamina and do a little more damage. What is that? What is that standing in for? To my mind, that kind of loot is standing in for being strong, being able. Everyone wants to be strong, dangerous, deadly, to be effective. Um, there's this great um, passage from the Bible about that you all have probably all heard called uh, Blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. There's an interpretation of this verse that I fucking love. It says something to the effect of, if you translate it differently, it could be understood more, more appropriately as those who, have, um, those who have strength and the ability to use it or withhold it shall inherit the earth. Basically, that competence, strength, and restraint, under restraint, is the thing you want. And gear is something we can have to be a proxy for growing stronger. What else? Um, can't think about MMOs without talking about achievements, right? Chivos, achievement points. Uh, I remember when these came into Wrath of the Lich King back in 2009, man. Never forget it. Um, it seemed so weird to me at the time, but 
it's become everything and everywhere. Uh, what being need is trying to be met when we pursue achievements over and over and over again and try to get every single achievement point and rack up all those points on our character name? Where we're trying to be experienced, we're trying to be well traveled, we're trying to have consumed a lot of different things, to be worldly, to be understanding of the way things work. Um, a noble pursuit in of itself, but is every single achievement we have actually going to help us do that? No, of course not. The last piece of loot I'm going to think about is titles. Titles are something that are another another kind of reward system you have in games like MMORPGs. And titles, in my mind, are um, a thing you can have in order to stand in for the um, the need of being distinguished, right? I'll never forget when um, the first Raid Wing of Guild Wars 2 came out at the end of 2015. And along with it, there was a title you could get. Um, the Eternal. And this is a title you could get if you beat every single encounter in the raid without having any one die. And at the beginning, it was pretty prestigious. Along the way, it became less prestigious because people worked through the strategies. And as most of y'all know, Guild Wars 2 is a game that has no vertical gear progression. So there's no, so the, the content is ever kind of evergreen forever. And the more you do it, the more it kind of becomes routine. And then there's power creep. And but anyway, some people paid for this title. They would pay somebody in order to get this so that they could have that distinction accrue to their character and to themselves, despite the fact that they did nothing to really earn it other than buy it. Having titles is a stand-in for being distinguished, I think. As an example, um, I think one of the most public figures that we have in the world of gaming discourse in 2021 when it comes to these kinds of phenomenons, this modal confusion of trying to become something by having all these things is your boy, Asmongold. Asmongold is not one thing, right? I'm not going to boil down Asmongold and try to suggest that he's one thing. He's essentially this or essentially that. I'm just going to talk about a couple dimensions of the character that he portrays on his stream, whether that's him or not, we can debate. Um, and how, how this figures into this overall discussion of why loot is overrated and how it's an example of modal confusion. So number one thing that, that Asmund Gold is kind of known for when it comes to loot is being a loot ninja. The guy just takes shit, sets up groups, and he takes all the loot, accrues it to himself. Um, he's obviously trying to become something. And when he doesn't get loot, you can see the pain in his face. I particularly chose a snapshot of him looking like he's experiencing some pain in order to show this off. Um, but an even greater example, I think, when it comes to Asmongold about this modal confusion are his mount off contests. These are famous things where what he does is he sets up these one on one duels um, where uh, the first player has to produce. Uh, amount that he thinks the other player doesn't have and the other player has to has to then hop on the mount if they don't have that mount they have to then pull a different mount out that they think, they think the other guy doesn't have and it's a contest of can you have mounts that the other guy does not all about having right well what is the point of having a lot of mounts i mean i kind of already said this right i think it's uh stand in for being accomplished and so this is a contest of accomplishment trying to find out who the most accomplished person is in a duel. And when Asmongold loses these bout contests, which he occasionally does, he feels pain. And where does that pain come from? Well, you could ask him, but to me, I think a logical thing to feel pain for in that kind of a situation is your lack of accomplishment compared to someone else is being laid bare for the world. And that's tough. The pain of losing tells us something. And that very pursuit of comparing things that I have versus things that you have is an easy illustration of being locked into this having mode, being stuck in the palace of existential needing to have things. Um, 
now I'm going to loop this all back around. To preach. And the very video that kind of inspired me to think about this. Here's the clip. Because I have to be honest with you guys, one of the reasons I don't really play these games, I don't really care about loot. I've not been excited about loot for about 10 years, ever since I got my trusty bulwark of Azanoth in World of Warcraft, which was bulwark. the last time I really craved an item. That's why I still have this wonderful bag with me. That was the last time I really craved an item in a video game. Loot has kind of lost a lot of its meaning for me, but... So unlike Asmongold, for Preach, loot has lost its meaning. And it's not something he craves anymore. So what is Preach suggesting here? Well, the pursuit of loot can be a bad thing. Having loot versus being transformed. How do you avoid this kind of peril of falling into a, into a mode of being overly concerned with loot? Well, to answer this question, I'm going to pivot back to the myth of Siddhartha Gautama. How did Siddhartha deal with this problem? This realization that, because what happened to Siddhartha, and I actually didn't tell this part of the myth, is it is it he actually left the palace and he encountered suffering for the first time in his life. He encountered sick people and he didn't understand it. He encountered old people and he didn't understand it. He encountered a dead person and didn't understand it. Why is this person not moving when they, when they sleep? And he encountered um, uh, an aesthetic, uh, ascetic. How do you pronounce that word? A-S-C-E-T-I-C. -E and this is a person who is trying to become enlightened by self-denial. So Siddhartha tried to follow that example of trying to find meaning through self-denial, which is a complete rejection of his life in the palace, of having everything, having all the food, all the sex, everything that he wanted. He rejected it all. He cut his hair. He fled into the forest. He starved himself to the point where you could see his spine through his stomach. He practiced self-denial. And then... He passed out and fell in the river. You see, he was still modally confused. Because he went from being overly focused on having things in the palace to leaving the palace and being overly focused on not having things. And then he was rescued by a little girl who fed him rice pudding. And this told him something important. It told him that the path for him he needed to follow was not a path fleeing towards having things in the palace. It was not a path towards not having things, by starving himself out in the forest, but rather a middle path of rejection of both self-indulgence and a rejection of self-denial. The middle path is something you can Google, and I recommend you do. I'm not going to explain it too much further. There's a lot to go in there. However, I'm going to bring this home by going back to Preach and having him describe to me what a sort of gaming middle path kind of looks like. Take it away, Preach. After the discovery of the gems and the support gems, it made loot much more exciting because now you started to think about, wait a minute, if I get like a two-handed axe, which really fits my build, and that has the gems in it that also support the skills I want to apply to that weapon. And perhaps it's even got four gems or five gems that are all linked. So I could maybe put four modifiers on this one spell, which could boost its melee, it could make them bleed, it could poison them, it could do all sorts of stuff, it could make them spin in circles, it could do all sorts of crazy <laughs> things. That would be really cool to play, not just make me do more damage which is where my interest lies right my Key interest point like, up. falls off when it's a case of oh your damage goes up by x percent i don't really care right as long as i can overcome my challenge i don't really care but when it changes your gameplay oh baby magnifique so that's when it really got exciting because then i was checking items to see what they got changing your gameplay 
transforming your gameplay, becoming something, transformation. Thanks, Preach, for making me think about this. Another person who thought about this, Roman emperor and Stoic philosopher Marcus Aurelius, who suggested that one can live well even in a palace. And yes, he was talking about the palace we're all talking about. Even in a place that's full of temptation of having or the rejection of temptation by denying and self-denial, one can still live virtuously. There is a middle path. So now I'm going to indulge just a little bit, a little bit, in um, a couple of games that I know and love. I challenge myself to think about what like a middle path between self-indulgence and self-denial could look like for engaging with these games. I'm going to start with um, Guild Wars 2, a game I've talked about a lot. This is a game that has literally has loot boxes in its cash shop, which to me is focus a little bit too much on having. Um, also, you could just completely reject the cash shop altogether and only focus on rewards that are gotten through gameplay and ignore even the gold exchange with the cash shop. I, don't, I think this is kind of focused a little bit too far in the other direction of not having. So there are a few gameplay systems and ways of transforming the way that you engage with Tyria that I think are really on the table for anyone who's approaching the game for the first time and doesn't know it yet. Um, number one, um, I'm going to start with the easy ones. Uh, not mount skins necessarily, but the mounts themselves. A lot of the questions people will ask you about Guild Wars 2 is if you're playing for the first time, should you go to Path of Fire to unlock the mounts before you play the rest of the game? I think most hardcore players who are focused on like having an authentic experience will say, no, play through the game without the mount. You can do that if you want. I think that a more reasonable way of thinking about this would be to at least get one mount, the Raptor mount, to start off. This is going to transform the way the entire game plays, and it's going to make you a lot more caught up with the way everyone around you is playing it at the time which is going to feel meaningful. Gliding, same thing. Gliding is a little less impactful in Guild Wars 2 than mounts are, but still unlocking the basic gliding ability it, so you don't die when you jump off of cliffs and shit, it's a little bit of a transformative thing, isn't it? Um, another item in the game's cash shop that, in my opinion, has true transformative ability for the way that your experience within the game is is the copper-fed salvage o -matic. Now, this is an example of ArenaNet creating a problem and selling a solution, yes. But we live in the world where these things happen. We live in the world where, in between every single inning of baseball, someone's trying to sell me a fucking hamburger or a bobblehead doll. We live in this world. We cannot completely disengage from those needs and flee into the forest. At least not all of us can, right? So the copper fed is one of those things that I think is in the, the cash shop and is truly transformative of the way that you play the game. Two more examples from Guild Wars 2. Number one, legendaries. Legendary gear, now that the new updates for Guild Wars 2 with the legendary armory are in, um, it's, a long, it's a long tail pursuit to chase the legendary gear. But because of the way that that the legendary armory now works where if you get a legendary, let's say, great sword, you can then instantly access that legendary great sword on any other character you play and any other build you play very easily. Um, I think it's truly worthwhile to pursue. Um, and then the last thing um, for Guild Wars 2 are masteries. Now, I actually wrote a post on the Guild Wars 2 subreddit, I think about three years ago. Um, just after Path of Fire had been released, and I was complaining about how all of the horizontal progression paths that were afforded by the Living World Season 3 Masteries 
were a total lie to the player base because none of those masteries carried outside of the maps that they originated in. There's this great, like, hook shot you get in one of the maps on Draconis Mons to navigate around the inside of a volcano caldera. It's badass, but it only is on the one map. It's just a map mechanic. It's not a true horizontal progression that your character can carry with you into the rest of the world. There are bouncing mushrooms in Heart of Thorns, and there weren't any in Path of Fire. What the heck? Anyway, without going into too much detail, they fixed this. Someone on reading that read my post, clearly, and decided to say, hey, we should probably start, like, making sure these things that we told people were horizontal progression actually are, actually do transform the gameplay of these players out in the world on a day-to-day -day basis. And they're much better about this now. Um... Those are all pretty close to middle path solutions to engaging with the microtransaction laden of Guild Wars, world of Guild Wars 2 that I can perceive. Got them on Dragonfall, you guess. Yeah, exactly, Grex. And there are a few in other places too. Generally don't matter because flying mounts go burr. Yeah, yeah, I think that's okay though. I think the important thing is that they're an option. They're there, that they exist. They aren't just in one map. The other game that I'm going to think about for a second in terms of a middle path way of engaging with microtransactions and loot is specifically Planet Side 2, another game I know a lot about. Um, it's a massively multiplayer online shooter where uh, a few hundred people per faction load up and try to fight over territory. Um, this is a game where you progress your character. You unlock certification points by everything you do. Use certification points to kind of unlock stuff on your player class to unlock new weapons. But one of the things about Planet Side that really heavily characterizes it is that there's no vertical progression. You Once you get a few basic unlocks in place for each class, there's no way to make yourself stronger. You don't do more damage per bullet. You don't do more, you don't have more health. Um, instead, progressing in Planet Side is about becoming more able to adapt by changing loadouts by being able to, to pilot vehicles, by being able to drop into different situations, you become more horizontally progressed in this massively online PvP game and able to change your loadout to interact with more kinds of situations. Because of this, I think that there that the ways of multiplying certification gain for Planet Side are a pretty good value if you're playing this game. Um, and that's membership, which is 15 bucks a month, experience boosts, which you can buy for cash. You combine those two things up, then every single minute you're playing the game, you're getting a lot more horizontal progression out of it than if you weren't doing those things. Um, and the last really cool piece of, of uh, horizontal progression that I really like with Planet Side 2 are the ASP tokens, which um, once you hit a certain rank, which you will get to faster if you're using boosts in Planet Side, um, then, then you'll be able to um, uh, unlock really special perks for your classes. For example, for me, um, I play the Light Assault class, which is the class that has a jetpack on its back. So it's not the most tanky class, but it's very mobile. And one of the things I love is um, the SMG secondary. Normally, your secondary weapon slot in Planet Side is a pistol slot only. However, this ASP token allows me to put a SMG there, a little bit of a bigger weapon, a close quarter automatic weapon. There's a particular SMG called the Punisher, and the Punisher has a fire mode that will fire off an impulse grenade. If you're in the air as a light assault, and you sh light assault and you shoot this impulse grenade, it will propel you sideways. So what I do is I play light assault, and I use this impulse grenade on my secondary slot to shoot myself around the battlefield, and it's hilarious. I made a montage on YouTube called Yeet Assault, because I love it so much. Um, and it's a really cool like progression of the game where you're able to do more things, not able to do existing things better. So, you could engage your planet side by kind of never putting any money in and just grinding away. Um, however, if you're doing that, you're just getting less results out for the same amount of effort that, that other people are putting in, which I think is kind of silly. Um, and you could engage by just buying everything. You can buy almost every single unlock with cash in planet side too. If you're doing that, I think you're also missing the point because you're cheating yourself of any ability to progress by playing the game. And part of the fun, when you win an alert or lose an, or even if you lose an alert, 
is getting the little payload of certification points. It's going to let you unlock the next thing. And if you don't want to unlock anything, then, you know, it's just not as fun, is it? Anyway, that's the talk for today. We started by talking about how loot is overrated and we ended with Buddhism and the middle path. I am very curious to hear what people think about this. But what we're going to do is we're actually going to launch in a little bit of housekeeping because here's the deal. Um, my wife has been helping me out with marketing and communication stuff for my podcast. And one of the things that she, she asked me about when I showed her these Deeg Thoughts videos that I've been producing is why aren't these podcasts? And it was a damn good question I didn't have a good answer to. Why aren't these podcasts? Why don't I have them up on Spotify? Why don't I have them up on iTunes? Why don't you, don't you have one podcast feed for the interview and one podcast feed for the individual thing? So I think that's something I'm going to do. Um, I'm going to be... Uh, over the next few weeks, figuring out how to get this it, its own podcast presence. And maybe changing the presentation of Deke Thoughts so it's a little more podcasty. Um, I'm not sure exactly how I want to do this. I don't want to, like, overly load it down with a bunch of, like, oh, you know, here's how I'm feeling today. I really want to focus on the payload of the thought that I'm preparing for the week. But there is a goal there to make this into something that's more potent and interesting for people. Um, give a bit of housekeeping if you're this far into the conversation that I know you like my content. And I'm curious to hear from y'all how much you care about me being on Twitch. Because I've been seeing some very persuasive arguments recently about how YouTube live streaming might be a better bet for small streamers like myself. And given that I think most people who find me on Twitch tend to be getting there by following a link from my YouTube videos. I think there's a pretty good argument to be made that maybe it's a better place for me to be long term. If you care a lot about Twitch, I'm really curious to hear what you think. Um, I haven't decided to do this yet, but it is something that I'm really strongly considering. Um, I guess the next thing to mention is schedule. So... Um, in order to show off my schedule, we'll do this. And when I, by this, I mean show off the website. Check this out. DeekThoughts.com, also DeekChats.com, we'll get you there as well, is used to be just a place where my RSS feed for my podcast was stored, but my wife has helped me massively flesh it out, add links to everything, and um, also uh, include a schedule of upcoming events. So if you're listening to this um, either live or within a day or two after it's been published, you can look forward to me being back here live um, interviewing Enders. Enders is a highly skilled, highly, I think we can say, opinionated Battlefield player and content creator. Makes his, makes montages and tells us what he thinks about past Battlefield games and especially about the forthcoming Battlefield 2042. I'll be interviewing him on September 9th, starting at around 9.30 p.m. Eastern Time. So be there for that. I think that's going to be really fun. I'll also be back one week after that to talk to McLean Deemer. We've rescheduled a couple times. I'm hoping that this time is going to work for everybody involved. Um, he's a really accomplished composer for titles such as Guild Wars 2, Crucible, and he worked on Rock Band, which I think is pretty cool. Um, dude's legit, and I love a lot of the stuff that he's done. I also have quite a bit of uh, Irons in the Fire where the podcast is concerned. I'm really interested in uh, branching out and not just living in the familiar territory of kind of repeating myself. Um, and doing more of what I've already done. So we're going to explore strange new worlds and see what we find. In any case, socials will be in the descriptions for if you, anywhere you see this. I'm Deeg. This is the Deeg Thoughts. I guess we can call it a podcast now. And this is hopefully the start of something pretty cool.
I will catch y'all next week, Monday night, at hopefully 9 o'clock Eastern Time. Have a good night.